Hello and welcome to another edition of Kent Thinks Discovers. Today we'll be screening La Cristiada, A Civil War, which follows historian Dr. Mark Lawrence from the University of Kent as he unpicks one of the most divisive chapters in Mexico's modern history. We'll be joined by Dr. Lawrence a little later on, as well as Dr. Nathaniel Morris from UCL and Professor Ben Falor from Colby College in the United States. And they'll be on the line to answer your questions, which you can send in live on our YouTube comments panel but do bear with us if we encounter any technical issues as we're all obviously social distancing and remoting in from our various homes. I'll be back in a little bit, but first here is La Cristiada, a civil war. La Cristiada, the Cristero War, was a religious conflict in Mexico. It tore families apart and killed thousands from 1926 to 1929, and all this after more than a decade of violence unleashed by the Mexican Revolution. The Revolutionary Constitution of 1917 claimed to limit the power of the Catholic Church. But this was not attempted in earnest until Plutarco Elias Calles became president of Mexico in 1924. Mexican Catholics rallied against Calles' anti-clericalism, and in July 1926, the church went on strike, suspending religious services and sacraments. This led to a spontaneous uprising in many parts of the country. Although the war ended in 1929 with a federal government victory, the aftershocks of this violence plagued Mexico until as late as the 1940s in some places. I've been researching this for four years with the University of Kent, and what I want to do is to show that this did not just pit the church against the state, but also town against country, village against village, and family against family. Zacatecas, like the rest of Western Mexico, was deeply affected by the Cristero War. To this day, the war continues to affect the lives of ordinary people and even their relations with church and state. Many people see this as a religious war, and indeed it was a religious war, but it was much more than that. It was a civil war, a bloody, complicated and violent affair that continues to affect the lives of people of this state and the region beyond. My research focuses on the people caught up in this war and who had to pick sides women, indigenous people, and ordinary civilians, and how they survived. I traveled to Mexico City to meet Jean Mayer, a pioneering historian who began working on the Cristero War over 50 years ago, at a time when memories were still raw, and neither church nor state welcomed research into this tragic episode in Mexican history. The Cristero was a civil war, and it's the same story as in every uh, civil war. People have a lot of different motivation, and I'm discovering some fantastic things that I ignored completely. And for instance, that really the great majority of the Mexican bishops was not in favor of the war was not even in favor of the suspension of the cult. It was a kind of imposition, a small radical group, the brothers of the radical anti -curricum. These aspects are what I want to delve into. It led me to try to find someone who could tell their story to me and be an example of the pain caused and still felt a century on. Muchísimas gracias. Sí, aquí estoy otra vez. Este vez con el equipo de, de hecho, de Kent TV, es un canal regional de radio. This is a local radio station in Fresnillo, in Mexico, where I came to talk about connecting my research to the local community. 
And one of the stories that arose from that was a story of Aurora, a very old lady whose father was killed in the Quisero War. Her family was exactly what I wanted to find so that we could see the real impact on families who were caught up in the danger and chaos of the war. To this day, it's still hard for the family of Toribio to speak about when he died. But 103-year-old Aurora and her son Raul spoke of their family's experience of the Cristero War. Mi madre acostumbró relatarnos la historia del abuelo y de la guerra entre cristeros y federales desde muy temprana edad. Y para ella fue sumamente dolorosa porque vio cómo mataban a mi abuelo en su casa, vio cómo caía al suelo e incluso una tía de ella, Juanita, le quitó el gabán al abuelo e hizo que mi madre lo lavara en el río, donde ella normalmente nadaba. Para nosotros como mexicanos, fue una de las guerras más cruentas y más sanguinarias que ha sufrido México. El padre de mi madre, el abuelo Toribio Cepeda, que nosotros lo consideramos un mártir de esa revolución. Records tend to be biased towards the church or the state. But part of this hope for a better understanding is opening a museum in Guadalupe, Zacatecas. My research, along with the help of local people, will spread understanding to a town that was central in the conflict. We got special access to a rare archive which will help us expand our knowledge and inform people here of what their ancestors went through. Sigue siendo muy complicado hablar del conflicto religioso en Zacatecas, tanto por el Estado como por la Iglesia. Creo que a casi 100 años del inicio podemos estar en condiciones de entablar nuevas perspectivas que hablen de los dos lados y compaginarlas en un solo proyecto. Y sobre todo que tiene un beneficio a la población para entender de mejor manera cómo fue el conflicto, que nos permite entender que ni el Estado actuó de una manera de solamente ir por hacia los católicos como que la Iglesia tampoco se sublevó por nada. Entonces creo que la apertura de archivos a finales del de siglo XX, los archivos judiciales, nos va a permitir tener una mejor visión de la situación. Sobre todo porque los archivos del gobierno del Estado o fueron, eh, fueron, sufrieron una inundación o algunos fueron este, quemados, también algunos municipales. Behind me on this hill you can see the letters Viva Cristo Rey, Long Live Christ the King. You can only find letters like this in the western parts of Mexico, where the Cristero War was fought. It gives us an idea about how people in this area remember the conflict as fundamentally a religious crusade. This museum is a vital bit of history, and one that the residents of San Julián felt passionate enough to fund with a public subscription. The artifacts within were donated from people in the town which shows how crucial it is to these rural areas to celebrate their martyred ancestors. Este museo está hecho del por los sanjulianenses para los sanjulianenses. Entonces el objetivo es que que este lugar sea una casa de resguardo de la memoria histórica, mostrar esta parte de la historia que mucho tiempo fue olvidada y que fue negada por los libros de historia de México. Y el objetivo es que no se pierda esa historia, por lo tanto el museo tiene como objetivo mostrar desde los antecedentes a nivel nacional, eh, estatal, regional y local. The need to relay a clear and objective vision of the war led me to what is a fascinating way of telling its story. Ballads and songs were passed down through generations. They serve as a place to store and discover history and a crucial addition to my research. El corrido no es general en toda la República Mexicana, sino de una parte de la República, ¿no? Y está muy ligado pues a las sociedades más de rancho, ¿no? El corrido jugó un papel fundamental para narrar los hechos que estaban produciéndose en ese momento, ¿no? Pues se siguen interpretando y se siguen recordando. 
porque es algo popular, ¿no? Se escribe y se canta para la gente para narrarle los hechos que se están produciendo y que merecen la pena recordarse, ¿no? My research evolves our understanding of a time in Mexico that is vitally important to remember. Innocent lives in turmoil, stuck between two of the most influential powers at the time. Indigenous regions in the center west, especially the Tepehuano of Durango, joined the Cristero Revolt to ward off the encroachment of the Mexican state onto their ancestral lands and their everyday traditions. Here the suffering of the civil war did not really end until the 1940s. Like all civil wars, civilians were the main victims. Women played a key role as well, acting as couriers, spies, smugglers, and in traditional roles, such as cooks, cleaners, and nurses for Cristero troops. Rural civilians were reconcentrated or driven off their estates, villages and ranches in order to create free fire zones for the federal army. Conditions facing refugees in overcrowded towns were appalling, but civilians who defied the government to return home faced reprisals from either the federal army or from the Criseros. Rural landowners were afraid of the Mexican Revolution's plans to break up the larger states and replace them with communal land holdings. But their fear led many of them to support the Cristero rebels. The great agrarian reform in Mexico happened during the following years, in the 30s, maybe as a consequence of the Cristiada. Maybe the government thought if we want to control or to, to get the sympathy of the Mexican people, we have to give the land. And some peasants receive the land, but with a condition. You have to defend the government. Take the gun and be our counter guerrilla against the Cristero. So the land question was a factor in the civil war, in that dimension of civil war it was part of the tragedy. Such a fascinating story, and we've got uh, Dr. Mark Lawrence on the line now, as well as Dr. Nathaniel Morris from UCL and uh, Professor Ben Falor from Colby College in the United States, all on the line to talk about the film and some of the topics surrounding it, and also to answer your questions at home that you can send in on our YouTube live comment section. Um, Mark, let's begin with you. The Cristero War, um, obviously a really divisive chapter, um, very well known in Mexico um, and in, in North American circles, not uh, not perhaps as well known over here in, in the UK and other parts of the world. So for you, how did you come across this mm. chapter and, and why did you want to study it in more depth? I came across it really um, from my understanding um, where church state conflict is very common in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I saw quite a few parallels even to the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s, which of course is a global event, very well understood. Um, there are similarities and I knew the area in Zacatecas and surrounding states quite well. And so bit by bit, I got intrigued by um, this civil war, this religious inspired war, um, which as you rightly say, resonates a great deal in Mexico and is well understood in, neighbor in the neighboring United States, um, but doesn't really have much much impacts um, in Britain, certainly. And I guess as well, one of the reasons it, it, it perhaps resonates so much is it was part of a, a time of real upheaval in, in the country. It wasn't long after the mm. um, famous Mexican Revolution. Um, how, how are they connected, both, both of those conflicts? Well, um, the Mexican Revolution is really um, a national revolution in Mexico. It had no pretense to a universal value system like the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, even though it was inspired in some ways by other revolutions. Um, and that uh, created uh, a sovereignty based on some sort of popular will 
even though rival factions of the revolutions fought out in interminable civil wars for the decade after 1910. Some sort of peace came in 1920, even though factions remained. Um, the big question driving the Mexican Revolution was the land, um, a very entrenched problem in Mexican history. Um, and there were lots of claims to a more equitable land ownership. And this was a burning issue with different radical factions like the Zapatistas supporting a more radical land settlement and more reactionary and conservative forces trying either to halt land redistribution or to, to moderate it in various ways. The religious question was also part of the Mexican Revolution because the Catholic Church had assumed a very strong position in Mexican life at the, uh, on the eve of the Mexican Revolution almost recovering the power it had enjoyed under the Spanish colonial era. Um, and it were, these were two mutually antagonistic forces in national life, the Catholic Church um, and the Mexican revolutionary government. The constitution of 1917 claimed to exert very strict control over the Catholic Church, but the uh, relevant articles in this constitution were not fully implemented until uh, the president, Elias, uh, Putarco Elias Calles, came to power in 1924, um, and that provoked the uh, church response, um, and which in turn inspired lots of uh, uprisings, uh, which developed into what we call the Cristero War. Nathaniel, I want to bring you you in now. There's um, there's some crossover between um, your areas of uh, research and Marx. Um, you've also got a very personal link with um, with Mexico. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in in studying um, uh, Mexican history. So I have um, I have family in Mexico um, in the state of Nayarit, which uh, borders. Zacatecas, where Marx's research focused. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I went out to visit them. They're sort of long lost family, as it were. Um, and at that point, I was studying history and I was just interested to know a bit more about the, the history of, of the region where they live. Um, and I realized there was very little actually written about that. Um, and then I met some of my cousin's mates who are um, Virarica or Huichol uh, indigenous people. And I was asking them about, um, you know, their history during the revolution, which I was studying at the time at Oxford. Um, and, you know, they said, you know, they, they told me all sorts of interesting stories. I then looked for some, you know, books uh, to explain a bit more about this history. And, and there was kind of nothing there. Um, and I kind of found a niche, I guess, um, there. I decided that if the history hadn't been written down, but was still kind of current um, amongst the, the local indigenous people, um, maybe I should write it. Um, and well, to an extent, that's that's what I managed to do. Um, and and a lot of that history of, of the revolution to them is actually the, the history of the Cristiada, um, when they talk about La Revolución, they're often talking about the conflict, um, political, social, religious, um, agrarian that, that kind of, yeah, defined the Cristiada rather than the revolution per se um, in the area that they live. And you talked a bit about um, indigenous identity there, and I know that's something that you've really focused on with, with your research. How... How much would it, would something like La Cristiada or, or a really um, divisive chapter like that in, in history, how much of an impact would that be on identity for, for Mexicans, you know, from town to town, city to city, even in regions? How, how much of an impact would it have on identity? Potentially massive. It depends very much where in Mexico you are. Um, because some areas of the country were sort of almost completely untouched by the Cristiada. But in, in Western Mexico um, and certain other parts of Central Mexico, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the Cristiada was a sort of epoch defining, generation defining conflict that um, overlaid older conflicts um, and has had a big impact on how people identify. Um, as members of communities, um, 
when it comes to the indigenous peoples of Mexico that I've worked with, there's a lot less um, kind of tribal identity. Um, it's really about the community that you come from. And some of those communities um, sided or the majority factions in those communities sided with the government during the, the Cristero conflict and others sided with the Catholic rebels. Um, and depending on what side, you know, they kind of went with, um, yeah, you know, they're, they're gobernistas or agraristas or Cristeros or, or whatever. The funny thing is that this, you know, the, the four peoples of this area of Mexico where I work, um, are amongst the least orthodox Catholic um, groups in all of Mexico. So a lot of the the people who in the 1920s and 30s, um, during the second Cristiada, sided with the Cristeros were actually traditionalists who were not Catholic in any way that a conventional Catholic would understand Catholicism. And equally, those who sided with the government had absolutely no identification really with the kind of revolutionary state's ideals. Um, the kind of the, the very big national level conflict between Catholics and sort of revolutionary anti-Catholics um, in, in the indigenous areas where I work really, it really came down to um, much more local factors. Um, you know, how, how closely do you identify with, um, you know, traditions which are potentially not very Catholic at all, or with this kind of modernizing force that was the revolution. Um, and yeah, and you know, those those kind of factional divides still exist today. There are, there are factions within communities where I've worked that um, are still kind of anti-state and pro uh, kind of communal autonomy um, based on the fact that, you know, their grandfathers um, were Cristeros, and therefore there's this just kind of anti-state thing built into um, you know, the, their sort of familial and communal culture. Um, ben, I'd like to go through that um, yes. with you in, in a little bit more depth. Um, Nathaniel and, and Mark have both touched upon it about the role of religion in, in the Cristero War. Mm -hmm. um, how ingrained is religion in um, in Mexican society, Mexican politics, um, especially during that period and also up to the present day? Well, the, the, it, it varies from region to region and even within regions, uh, as, as Nathaniel said. But it's fair to say as a country as a whole, it's, it's still a Catholic country and the revolution was anti-clerical. And I, I, my research focused on the 1930s and discovered, as, as Mark has argued as well, um, that the Cristero War didn't really end in a lot of parts of Mexico. Uh, and particularly in the 1930s, Catholic organizations, lay organizations more than clergy, Catholic ideas, um, and Catholic leadership. Again, lay leadership uh, led a largely, but not entirely, uh, bloodless resistance to the revolutionary state and attempts to distribute land um, to create a secular, some would say socialist educational system and uh, implant a grassroots support for the ruling party uh, that ruled Mexico until 2000. And I think to the, to the present day, uh, this and many of the fault lines, both regionally uh, and even locally uh, still persist. Um, and in some ways, the Cristero War, not unlike the Civil War in the United States, for a lot of people isn't over, and there's great disagreement who the good guys and the bad guys were, uh, for lack of a better term. You, you're um, obviously a, a professor in um, Latin American history, um, uh, Ben. You've, we've heard um, Mark say that kind of his interest in getting into this field was because he could see that there were links with other conflicts. Um, have you found, uh, be, being across the border from uh, Mexico in, in the States, do you find that it's, that is something that really resonates with, um, with, with Mexicans and with, with Americans? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. And uh, historians like Julia Young have 
uh, discovered the extent to which the Mexican American community, uh, which was present in large numbers uh, since the Mexican American War and grew in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, was divided as well by the Cristero War. And as Mark says, many of the people that went to the United States after the Cristero War were from the Cristero heartland. Uh, and they strongly identified with the Cristero side. But this is by no means universal. Many Mexican Americans supported the government uh, for a variety of reasons. So in some ways, this, this, the Cristero War spilled over and those divisions have linked to it. And in the United States population that wasn't uh, of Mexican descent was also divided. Catholics very strongly sympathized with the Cristero War in the United States but we're not willing to go so far as to volunteer in large numbers or send arms. Uh, and the US government, which was largely sympathetic uh, to the government side, made sure that arms could not be set, uh, which is, as Mark argues, was decisive in the defeat of the Cristero War. Um, it's very hard to win uh, an insurgency without support from outside or a, a haven across the border which the United States government denied the Cristeros here. Hearing all three of you talk about it um, so passionately is, is really great for uh, any historians or anybody with an interest in this um, period out there. And um, we'll be talking about that in a, in a little bit. But first, we've got, um, well, first of all, keep sending in your questions on uh, YouTube and to us and we'll get them answered um, with our panel. Uh, we've had a question sent in from Phil Sover, but um, we've actually had a clip sent in uh, from, uh, from Phil, who is uh, one of Mark's PhD students. Um, we're going to play that first. Um, um, he's currently based out in Mexico looking at the second Cristero War, um, and he sent in a clip giving his thoughts on the film. Hello, I'm Phil Stover. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Matortiz, uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, where, where I live. And it's my privilege to um, be a PhD student at the University of Kent and uh, able to do my research right here in my home country of Mexico. And it has uh, really, it's, it's a perfect situation. And I appreciate very much uh, what Kent has done for me and especially Dr. Lawrence as my dissertation supervisor. My research focuses on the uh, second Cristero War, uh, kind of the hidden little brother of the big famous first uh, for greater glory uh, Cristero War uh, that was down in central Mexico. The, the second Cristiado was fought and, and debated in northern Mexico across uh, the border states. And I'm just really excited about being able to do my research under Dr. Lawrence and focus on something that just has not received a whole lot of attention. One of the reasons I picked this topic was because um, the historiography of the second Cristiado is very, very thin. It's not, it's not, it didn't have big grand battles. It didn't have the fame of the revolution, but it was fought across a, a vast region of Northern Mexico about spiritual, church, faith kinds of issues, economic issues. It was fought about land issues. You know, the revolution didn't succeed in giving land to the people who thought they should have it. So in many cases, they were still fighting over land in the, into the 1930s. The second Cristiano went through the time period of the 1930s. Um, there was a lot of debate about ideology, about how should we educate our children? Should it be secular education? Should it be socialist oriented? Should it have values in it? So lots of things to look at, and it's a very complex situation. That's one reason why I appreciate Dr. Lawrence so much. He is not only a wonderful uh, Mexicanist, he knows Mexican history, but he has a special enthusiasm and love for the Cristero period. And that's the period in which I'm, I'm most interested in my research, focusing on re religion and uh, conflict. So he has been great with me. He has helped me. And uh, the depth of his knowledge is excellent. You'll see that. In, or if you haven't already seen it, you'll see it in the uh, documentary that's a part of this program. And uh, his love for... Uh, the Cristero period and the people of Mexico and the complexity especially of these conflicts has really helped me. It's helped me to expand 
my vision for what I want to do in my dissertation. Uh, I've added geographical uh, aspects to it. I've learned more about the uh, why the agrarians and the Cristeros didn't get along, uh, thanks to him. So I really appreciate being part of this program. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for me. It is one of the the most important things left on my bucket list, and uh, to to earn my PhD in Mexican history. I've learned, I've studied it, and loved it, lived it for 25, 30 years, and this is a rare opportunity. And I appreciate so much the flexibility of the university and of Dr. Lawrence to um, allow me to do my work and to do my research and uh, to realize that uh, maybe I'm a little bit atypical in being a 71-year-old PhD student. How many, how many of, their, of, of, of them in the world are there? So I'm very grateful. I thank the University of Kent for its support of my work and my research and Dr. Lawrence very much. And I wish you all the very best uh, uh, as you watch this documentary, as you watch this program, and just thank you all for your interest in Mexico and our Mexican history. Thank you. Lovely tribute there from Phil. We've also, uh, as a good student, Mark, he sent in a question on YouTube uh, as well. This one for you. Um, in December 1935, 500 federal troops from Chihuahua fought with 300 Cristeros in the Sierra Madre region of eastern Sonora. The federals burned a hidden Catholic seminary and library in that conflict. Was this one of the last military conflicts of the second Cristiada, or did that kind of fighting continue well into the later 19th? 30s? Well, it's a good question. Um, I would guess that that is not the last military confrontation of the so-called Segunda or Second Crisero War of the 1930s, uh, partly because the 30s themselves are much more, in some ways, more interesting because you have land reform in earnest taking place across large areas of Mexico in the 30s. You have the federal education program inserting schools into local communities in large numbers and often teachers were very unpopular in local communities um, and the second Cristero war which is quite hard to date when it begins and indeed when it ends precisely because it's so widespread um, and so this incident in December 35 in eastern Sonora certainly later there were incidents and Nathaniel would probably agree that there's violence right up until the early 1940s in some indigenous areas of Durango for example which is directly connected to lots of land disputes and vendettas which surged in the in the Crisero War. So the 20s Crisero War, which is the subject of my book and the documentary, is, is much easier to demarcate in terms of beginnings and ends, more or less. Um, but the 1930s is much more diverse, um, much more nationwide, mm -hmm. much more sporadic, um, and with lots of different uh, factors involved. Yeah, absolutely. And um, obviously there, Phil, thank you very much for sending in uh, that question. Any of you at home watching, if you have questions, of course, you can send them in on YouTube as well and we'll try and get them answered. Um, Mark, just sticking with you, it's really interesting to hear Phil's perspective. And I think one of the key things that came across in that film is there's been so many collaborators and contributors to um, this story. Um, there was Luis Rubio who provided the music. Um, we saw that museum in Zacatecas um, that, that has been constructed. Um, it, it's crucial, isn't it, to have these individuals to, to keep telling this story and, and building on it and um, spreading that word to, mm -hmm. to Mexicans and, uh, and, and across the world as you've done. Absolutely. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, for one thing, my wife is from Mexico and she's from that region. I have lots of in-laws living there. So it's a joy to be in Mexico anyway, for that reason. Um, and local people there, uh, local archivists, local people working in museums have been universally very friendly, very welcoming. Um, and so it really provided a great environment, uh, especially to, you know, unknown foreigners who are coming to the country, in some instances, looking into issues which are not very welcome or, or not some of which, it, you know, uh, have a very fond memory attached to them, partly for mm. the family reasons that we explored in the interview with the 103 uh, year old lady Aurora in the tree. And that's a good example of this. Um, but despite all of the uh, the burden of, of memory and trauma from that war nearly 100 years ago, uh, people in the region across Mexico are, are very welcoming, very helpful. 
And of course, when we shot the documentary uh, back in January before the global pandemic crisis, um, uh, the uh, KMTV had a great team and I worked with some great colleagues of yours, very professional, um, lots of travel, fun packed schedule of interviews, academics based in Mexico like Luis Rubio, um, local people who uh, volunteered to take part in the documentary. Um, so there's a whole list of uh, people to thank, including my own father-in-law, a man called Miguel Acosta, who was great with uh, uh, giving us lifts and uh, giving us insights into the local area, which he, he knows extremely well. Yeah, a, re a real collaborative effort. Um, and and I, I know from, from talking to my colleagues, a real joy to, to produce. Um, and Nathaniel, you, like Mark, you've got those um, familial links in Mexico. And it sounds like from doing your research, you've really uh, kind of embedded yourself into different communities and spoken to lots of people out there. Um, again, kind of how, how important is it to, to highlight those different perspectives from um, from different groups and different individuals for, for conflicts like the Crisera War. I mean, we, um, we saw Aurora in the film uh, and women obviously played a key role in that conflict. Um, so how, how important is it to get those different perspectives of history? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Cristiada and is a fairly kind of well-known conflict in Mexico, um, but primarily because of, you know, the work of Jean Mayer, which focused on a, a particular region um, or, or sort of three or four sort of key regions, um, all of which were majority mestizo regions. Um, and so there's a whole kind of untold history of um, indigenous people's participation in the, the Cristiada, um, and as Phil mentioned, I mean, the, the second Cristiada has been massively overlooked, um, whether that's the, the, the second Cristiada in indigenous regions, um, like where I was sort of studying or in northern Mexico. Um, and in fact, areas that were com almost completely unaffected by the first Cristero War um, were kind of quite central to the, the second Cristero War, um, mm -hmm. parts of Puebla, Oaxaca. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's been some really, really great work done on, on the Cristiada, but there's still, you know, thousands of stories to be told. Um, you know, women's kind of participation on both sides of the Cristero conflict um, is key. Um, the you know women were smugglers. Um, you know they they were essential to getting arms to the rebels. Um, they also mobilised um, on behalf of the agrarian kind of forces. And uh, yeah, so you know there's well it, you know it was a civil war, um, and in areas where that civil war took place, everyone was a part of it. Um, but as is usual. Um, the story of, of the kind of elites and the more important kind of figures within that conflict have potentially been told. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a huge amount more there um, that, that has never really been investigated by outside historians like us. Um, there are some local cronistas, uh, sort of chroniclers, I guess you'd say in English, um, you know, who are local people who are interested in the history, who have worked to, you know, do interviews and talk to their, you know, to, to local people, to the people that they live with about this, this conflict. But um, yeah, there's a lot more to be done, particularly by sort of outsider historians um, like us. Um, and also, I just wanted to say in, in answer to, to Phil's question, um, in southern Durango, in the the, the far south of Durango, which is about, well, back then it was about 90% indigenous, mainly Tepehuano. Uh, the last major battle took place in February 1939, um, which pitted 40 diehard kind of Cristero rebels who by that point weren't that motivated by Catholicism um, and were much more interested in a mixture of blood feuds, cattle rustling, and um, kind of conflicts uh, with 
the state per se um, against 600 federals. Um, they nearly managed to take a fairly major town, um, but some sudden reinforcements kind of pushed them back. And that same group then hit out in the Sierra launching hit and run raids until 1941. So, you know, this conflict goes on and on and on and on. And I think, especially in terms of the, the second Cristiada, there's a huge amount that has never really been investigated. And some of it is completely taboo um, in the areas where it took place. And so for that reason, it's also very hard to investigate. People don't necessarily talk about it because that conflict gave rise to conflicts that are still ongoing um, in those communities between families who, you know, have serious problems um, between you know, each other um, because somebody's great granddad killed somebody else's great granddad and sort of, you know, that, that conflict has potentially morphed into many newer conflicts um, and the dynamics have changed, but the roots are, are kind of in the 1920s and 30s and even into the 1940s. <laughs> Yeah, well, we hear um, all of you talking about it and we, we hear some of those accounts. It, it really is, is quite vivid and obviously still very much in the um, in the public conscious in Mexico. Um, we're getting a whole load of questions in on YouTube now. So thank you all uh, to you at home for uh, for watching and sending those in. Uh, ben, we've got a question for you from yes. Simon Sambury. He said, um, with the Mexican Revolution being so anti-clerical, can the war be seen as unavoidable? Also, the similar Similarities between the Carlists uh, using local issues and the first Carlist war are noticeable. So um, would you say that's fair to say that um, uh, that with the Mexican Revolution being so anti-clerical uh, that this war was unavoidable? Well, the fact that it, it took six years for it to ignite after the, the, the last episode of the armed phase from 1920 to 26 suggests it wasn't inevitable. Um, but the bloodiness and the intensity, I think, could have been avoided. Um, and as in part as, as Mark charts uh, and his work on Zacatecas, that both sides adopted strategies uh, that set off cycles of retaliation. Um, and as Nathaniel said, the, the, once these feuds start, it's very hard to, to wind them down. Um, so would there have been a conflict eventually? Probably yes. But something this bloody uh, and this long lasting, I think that could have been avoided. And also, uh, Ben, a question from Amy. Did the Cristeros face any consequences for their uprising after the Civil War? Uh, yes and no. Uh, Jean Mayer argues for a, a, a purge of many Cristeros after they were amnestied and laid down their arms. And Mark documents this did happen in some cases, but you also see cases that I found in the 1930s where Cristeros were rearmed by supposedly revolutionary politicians uh, for their own ends and killed former uh, Agaristas land grant recipients who had fought for the state uh, and had been disarmed. Uh, so there was sadly retaliation on both sides uh, that lasted well into the 1930s and those the casualties for that have never been counted. Uh, the number of federal teachers killed in the Second Cristero War, maybe 300, but civilians um, and former combatants, probably numbers in the thousands. Wow, so a, a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, it, you know, if it's still not fully being counted, that's, um, that's quite extraordinary. Um, uh, Mark, we got a question from uh, Mariana Sanchez. Uh, he says, congrats to Mark. I'd like to hear what he has to say about the Federal Army's use of auxiliary militia groups or defensas rurales uh, during and after the conflict to control the Cristeros. Oh, it's a good question. The, the defensas um, are a sort of local paramilitary groups organized at local level often uh, were placed under federal army commands because the federal army had a rule book that allowed it to proclaim martial law effectively whenever there was a danger of insurgency or rebellion in the locality which essentially gave the federal army a sort of carte blanche to perform as it as it saw fit against real and imagined insurgents and so the defenses are the local power base often they're mixed up with the so-called agraristas who are the candidates to receive government land grants. Sometimes they merge into the same thing. Often they're separate. 
um, but generally they're the uh, auxiliaries to the federal command. Um, what's interesting about them, because they're local people, often they know better how to fight the war locally. They have better intelligence networks. The federal army is often quite club-footed uh, with its centralized command structures. Um, so defense can operate very well but equally because they're risen with local interests and local factions sometimes they can defect to the other side sometimes they have rather shady corrupt dealings with local authorities uh, smuggling networks and so forth um, and in other cases they become another way of expressing vendettas and local uh, conflicts which pre-existed the Crusader War and, and in some cases have continued after the end of the war itself um, but they are important auxiliaries too the federal government's uh, um, attempt to to suppress the Crusader Rebellion. Uh, Mark, just a, a, another question for you that we've got from, um, uh, let me just try and find it here. We're just trying to get all those questions coming in. Um, we've got a question in from Sarah Klein. Um, she said she thought it was interesting that there was a, a local museum funded by the townspeople about their own experience during the war. Was there any recognition by the state or the church in the form of some kind of national museum monument or site of remembrance in a place of national significance? Obviously, this is um, quite a significant time uh, at the moment. It's a very topical issue yeah. about memory, about uh, statues. Mm -hmm. um, in answer to Sarah's uh, question, is that something that has been um, commemorated uh, nationally? Uh, thanks. Uh, I think that's Sarah Klein, another of my PhD students, who's doing a project on uh, public history. So she has a particular insight. Another um, very good student. She's like me. <laughs> another very good student. Um, uh, the, the short answer is I know that in the state of Guanajuato, which is geographically um, in the center of Mexico, um, uh, mm -hmm. in a mountain range called the um, Cerro de Gubilete, which is, I think, geographically the exact center, more or less, of Mexico, mm -hmm. um, there is a large religious monument, which over time has rather got bathed in a certain significance commemorating the religious war. Um, and equally, if you go mm -hmm. to local areas, especially in the state of Jalisco, the, the Altos region, which was strongly pro Crisero, you find several local museums, uh, very much like the one we saw in the documentary. Um, and there's a strong local memory of the war. But it is difficult because obviously, um, unlike, for example, the Carlists who were mentioned earlier in Spain, who were part of the reactionary right in the Spanish Civil War, um, the Criceros in Mexico lost their wars. Um, the regime in Mexico City imposed its will, um, and it was a one-party state up until 2000. So therefore, there was not much official uh, toleration for uh, dangerous narratives, if you like, which contested um, the legitimacy of the revolutionary state. Um, and so you see different phases mm -hmm. in memory, and, and in different regions it's, it's different. So in some parts, like the Altos of Jalisco, it's a defiant celebration of the Cristero War. Like those letters we see on the mountainside, Vida Cristo Rey, um, local museums. Um, the political party, the centre-right Catholic party, the PAN, uh, routinely wins elections there. And partly the PAN there plays to the Cristero War as a mobilising factor. In, not in all parts of Mexico does the PAN do that, but in that part of the country it does. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, it's very regionally specific. But you do see um, uh, a certain national significance at this location in Guanajuato that I mentioned. Um, and you see mm -hmm. um, some fairly distinguished filmmaking activities relating to the Crisera War, some famous and great writers, um, books like Rescoldo, for example, is a, a great um, mm -hmm. study of uh, the Crisera War, the great first magical realist novel in Latin America, Pedro Paramo, uh, from the early 1950s, mm -hmm. is inspired yeah. by the recent Crisera War. Um, so there's lots of unofficial uh, commemoration. There's much less official commemoration. Um, that changes a bit um, in the recent history when the single party PRI lost the federal elections in the year 2000. The PAN won the elections in the campaigning for that election. Uh, Vicente Fox, who was the uh, first PAN president in 2000, uh, flaunted uh, some Crisero symbols as part of his electioneering. Mm -hmm. um, he was known for being pro-Vatican in his politics and some of the famous symbols of Cruceros he used and he celebrated. Um, so there's, you mm -hmm. see a bit of uh, playfulness with the Crucero war amongst the right wing of politics uh, but in general I would say it's much more regional and locally specific. But, and, and also, <laughs> also Daniel, Fox I'd like to get from, your... I was going to say Fox is from oh, Guanajuato. Sorry, I got a... um, 
Fox Good is point. from yeah. Guanajuato. There's not just a left-right thing, but there's also a regional aspect even to his use of the symbolism. Um, yeah. You know, being a kind of rancher from Guanajuato who wears a cowboy hat and flaunts Cristero yeah. symbols um, kind of goes even beyond the kind of left-right um, Catholic yeah. anti-clerical thing and, and starts playing into... Um, yeah, kind of stereotypes of what, what different states are about, I guess, right. maybe a bit like in parts of the South where wearing a Confederate patch has become a symbol of kind of state identity mm -hmm. that goes beyond, uh, you know, real identification with either side in the Civil War, um, which just makes mm -hmm. it even more complicated to kind of unpick all of the different threads there. I, I think it's a really good question that Sarah asked. And yeah, if, could, could I just break in for a minute? Or could, yeah, or sure. We, Sorry, Ben, we got a little bit of a delay yeah. here. Sure. I was just going to say it's interesting that the state doesn't commemorate soldiers from that war. And I think only the Nino, Ninos Heroes from the U.S. invasion in 1847 uh, are commemorated. But what you do see is uh, commemoration of the school, t the federal school teachers that were killed by the mostly uh, second Cristero rebels, uh, including one in Zacatecas uh, in uh, the municipio of Tabasco, Maria Murillo, who was, and the term they use is martyred. Now, this is someone who's against the Cristeros, but she was martyred for the revolution, uh, according to the monument. And that's what I think the state uh, wants to remember. Uh, are the victims of the Cristeros, not the people fighting the Cristeros. Yeah. I think Ben's points, if I, if I may Apologies cut in, is, is for... excellent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, we have a delay. Um, sorry, uh, Mark, I'll hand it over martyrdom. to you. It was, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Ben's remarks about martyrdom are extremely important. Um, this is a, a civil war which almost dared not speak its name. It's often seen as being a crusade by some uh, mm -hmm. descendants of the Catholic militants in that war. Um, there's a very strange, ambiguous attitude towards the Catholic hierarchy also. Um, the real fighters, as, as a work by, from Jean Mayer has shown, um, who was the real path-breaking work in the late 60s and 70s, uh, this was very much a popular struggle in many ways. It was more the parish priest rather than the bishop who was likely to support or even sometimes fight alongside the Cristero rebels. Often local militants, uh, men wearing cowboy hats, great horsemanship, knowing how to handle guns, often egged on to fight by their wives and girlfriends, which is an extremely important um, uh, sort of command mm. in the macho culture of Mexico in the 1920s and 30s. Um, these men were ordered to defend their religion by their women folk, implication being if they did not, they were not real men, which is a terrible accusation to make in 1930s Mexico. Um, all of this is really important. And, and it seems a popular struggle. And in fact, one of the issues with the uh, truce or the armistice, which ends the first Cristero War in 1929, is that there was a political deal with US intervention to help it make it happen called the arreglos mm. in Spanish, the agreement which ended the violence. And the terms were pretty much all on the government side. Um, there was a sort of amnesty. There was lots of revenge after the war. Uh, Ben's research has shown that actually this, this vendetta, this revenge reprisal was not as extreme as we, we thought it was before. Um, but certainly it was a, a victory for the government side. And so lots of uh, Cristero veterans had very bitter feelings towards not just the government, but also the church hierarchy. Most of the bishops either sat on the fence or even went safely into exile or sometimes even back to the government. Um, and so there is a resentment at this um, and that's colored local opinions. Um, and so often it's been easier for local people, for historians, for politicians to think in terms of being a martyr. There were martyrs in this war because um, martyrdom in some ways is easier to handle. It's something which is easier to understand and to celebrate than the rather raw and gray area issues surrounding violence reprisals, vendettas, and so forth. Brilliant. Apologies again for any of those interruptions. As I've said before, we got a little bit of a, a lag here um, uh, as we're all remoting in um, while remaining socially uh, distant. Moving on, we've had another testimonial uh, sent in, uh, this time from Professor uh, Matthew Butler from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, again, he's been giving his thoughts uh, on the film and on Mark's research. Mark is a 
Uh, Paisano and a colleague of mine who researches the history of uh, modern Mexico, the religious history of, of Mexico, uh, we got to know each other through working on the, the topic of the Cristeros in, in different regions, um, but it's something we've both been working on for some time now. Um, so I think Mark has produced a lovely film um, on the Cristeros, very interesting documentary. It's the first time that the Cristeros have been studied by a, an English language documentary that I'm aware of. Uh, there are movies like Before Greater Glory, but Mark has a much more interesting take than, than that, I think. Um, uh, there are two things I especially enjoyed about the, the documentary. Um, one is that it has a very holistic take on the Cristero Rebellion. Uh, it isn't just a story of um, institutional conflicts between the Catholic Church and Mexico's revolutionary state. Um, he doesn't just uh, research um, stories of heroics and Catholic martyrdom in Mexico. Uh, that would be a bit like um, talking about the Battle of Britain and uh, not talking about the Blitz or the home front. Mark is very interested in the, the full complexity of the Cristero War and explaining what it really meant to, to many ordinary people um, in 1920s and 1930s Mexico to be, to be caught up in this um, religious tragedy. Um, Mark shows that the, the meaning of the Cristero War for many people was um, being chased away from your home by um, federal or Catholic forces, having your, your community go up in smoke, um, starving, being starving, um, cooking greens in the countryside, hiding out in the hills. He really recaptures a whole social experience that the, the more traditional readings and traditional stories of the rebellion don't really um, have much to say about. So I think his documentary is very interesting for that reason, just like his, his new book on the Cristeros. Um, the other thing I thought was very interesting about the the book and the, the documentary that spins off it is the Mark is especially interested in regional parts of Mexico and regional history in Mexico. He's very committed to studying the, the, the Zacatecas and the, the Jalisco region. Um, and there are lots of lovely images in the documentary of the kind of Catholic spaces in, in that part of Mexico, the, the Catholic um, uh, parts of popular culture in Mexico. Uh, and I think Mark is also very interesting, uh, is very interesting in the way that he focuses on the way that the Cristero Rebellion is, is remembered in that part of the of part of Mexico. Um, even by some of the young people that Mark interviews for his film, this is a very vivid and live um, experience for them. Uh, and I think Mark shows how what was a religious tragedy has become remembered as a kind of badge of Catholic identity for, for particular regions of, of Mexico. It's something that reminds them of their Catholic past and of their um, Catholic culture today. So it's important uh, perhaps in, in, in Mexico where globalization has taken its course that these kinds of local identities have been developed. Um, it's a very portable identity as well. Um, Catholic migrants to the United States bring the Cristero iconography and saints with them. Um, so over time the Cristero war has become uh, a badge of regional distinctiveness and a way for Mexican Catholics, wherever they may be, uh, in the United States or in Mexico, to, to remind themselves of their, of their community. So the, the documentary shows um, the half-life of the Cristero Rebellion and how it still is very meaningful to, to lots of Mexican people today. The, um, the topic itself is a very interesting one, extremely important topic. Um, I became interested in the, the Cristeros myself because um, obviously it was a very important part of the Mexican Revolution, which was the first great revolution of the, of the 20th century. The Cristero War was the, the critique of the revolution and, and a major aspect of, of Mexico's revolutionary history. Uh, and it just seems so unusual, uh, a, a peasant crowning of thorns in the, almost the, the, third, the second third of the 20th century seems such an unusual thing. Uh, and I think what, what Mark really brings forward in his book is, uh, like in, in a sense, is the, um, the importance of religion to many political conflicts around the world, which is a very old theme and a very modern theme, and we don't really have to go very far to find many other examples of that. Um, but in, the, in, in English history, for example, you'd have to go back to the Pilgrimage of Grace or some kind of uh, rebellion of that sort and in the 16th century. Uh, in Mexico, um, Northern Ireland, many other places, there, there are much more recent examples that are really worthy of study. And so I think uh, that's an important, important aspect of his film as well.
Thank you very much to Matthew for sending that in. Another really fitting, fitting testimonial uh, about Mark and the work uh, and this uh, incredible piece of history. Just as a final thought, uh, as we wrap up, we've had a testimony, uh, testimony come in from Karina Perez on Facebook. Uh, my great grandmother was alive during the Cristera War in Mexico. Given that they were seeking to murder all men in the region, she literally disguised my great grandfather as a woman and they fled to somewhere safe for months. So uh, some of those extraordinary mm. stories um, wow. that have come from this period, um, which we've been able to, to talk about uh, over the course of this event. I'd like to thank uh, Mark, Nathaniel and Ben, uh, all of you for joining and answering uh, all those questions that have come in on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you all at home for watching and sending those in. And uh, we'll be back for another Kent Thinks Discovers documentary, this time next week with PCV2 from Virus to Vaccine. Uh, to find out how a team from the University of Kent uh, has led a UK and Thai consortium uh, to mass produce a vaccine to tackle a deadly disease in pigs. Uh, another fascinating topic, uh, as we have every week here uh, on Kent Thinks Discovers. All that to look forward to, but in case you missed it at the top of the programme, uh, here is La Cristiada, a civil war to play again. Thank you all very much for joining and enjoy the rest of your evening. La Cristiada, the Cristero War, was a religious conflict in Mexico. It tore families apart and killed thousands from 1926 to 1929, and all this after more than a decade of violence unleashed by the Mexican Revolution. The Revolutionary Constitution of 1917 claimed to limit the power of the Catholic Church, but this was not attempted in earnest until Plutarco Elias Calles became president of Mexico in 1924. Mexican Catholics rallied against Calles' anti-clericalism, and in July 1926, the church went on strike, suspending religious services and sacraments. This led to a spontaneous uprising in many parts of the country. Although the war ended in 1929 with a federal government victory, the aftershocks of this violence plagued Mexico until as late as the 1940s in some places. I've been researching this for four years with the University of Kent, and what I want to do is to show that this did not just pit the church against the state, but also town against country, village against village, and family against family. Zacatecas, like the rest of Western Mexico, was deeply affected by the Cristero War. To this day, the war continues to affect the lives of ordinary people and even their relations with church and state. Many people see this as a religious war, and indeed it was a religious war, but it was much more than that. It was a civil war, a bloody, complicated and violent affair that continues to affect the lives of people of this state and the region beyond. My research focuses on the people caught up in this war and who had to pick sides women, indigenous people, and ordinary civilians, and how they survived. I traveled to Mexico City to meet Jean Mayer, a pioneering historian who began working on the Crisero War over 50 years ago, at a time when memories were still raw, and neither church nor state welcomed research into this tragic episode in Mexican history. The Cristiada was a civil war, and it's the same story as in every uh, civil war. People have a lot of different motivation, and I'm discovering some fantastic things that I ignored completely. And for instance, that really the great majority of the Mexican bishops was not in favor of the war. 
was not even in favor of the suspension of the cult. It was a kind of imposition, a small radical group, the brothers of the radical anti-clerical. These aspects are what I want to delve into. It led me to try to find someone who could tell their story to me and be an example of the pain caused and still felt a century on. Muchísimas gracias. Sí, aquí estoy otra vez, esta vez con el equipo de, de hecho, de Kens TV, es un canal regional de radio. This is a local radio station in Fresnillo, in Mexico, where I came to talk about connecting my research to the local community. And one of the stories that arose from that was the story of Aurora, a very old lady whose father was killed in the Crucero War. Her family was exactly what I wanted to find so that we could see the real impact on families who were caught up in the danger and chaos of the war. To this day, it's still hard for the family of Toribio to speak about when he died. But 103-year-old Aurora and her son Raul spoke of their family's experience of the Cristero War. Mi madre acostumbró relatarnos la historia del abuelo y de la guerra entre cristeros y federales desde muy temprana edad. Y para ella fue sumamente dolorosa porque vio cómo mataban a mi abuelo en su casa, vio cómo caía al suelo e incluso una tía de ella, Juanita, le quitó el gabán al abuelo e hizo que mi madre lo lavara en el río, donde ella normalmente nadaba. Para nosotros como mexicanos, fue una de las guerras más cruentas y más sanguinarias que ha sufrido México. El padre de mi madre, el abuelo Toribio Cepeda, que nosotros lo consideramos un mártir de esa revolución. Records tend to be biased towards the church or the state. But part of this hope for a better understanding is opening a museum in Guadalupe, Zacatecas. My research, along with the help of local people, will spread understanding to a town that was central in the conflict. We got special access to a rare archive which will help us expand our knowledge and inform people here of what their ancestors went through. Sigue siendo muy complicado hablar del conflicto religioso en Zacatecas, tanto por el Estado como por la Iglesia. Creo que a casi 100 años del inicio podemos estar en condiciones de entablar nuevas perspectivas que hablen de los dos lados y compaginarlas en un solo proyecto. Y sobre todo que tiene un beneficio a la población para entender de mejor manera cómo fue el conflicto, que nos permite entender que ni el Estado actuó de una manera de solamente ir por hacia los católicos como que la Iglesia tampoco se sublevó por nada. Entonces creo que la apertura de archivos a finales del de siglo XX, los archivos judiciales, nos va a permitir tener una mejor visión de la situación. Sobre todo porque los archivos del gobierno del Estado o fueron, es, fueron, sufrieron una inundación o algunos fueron este, quemados, también algunos municipales. Behind me on this hill you can see the letters Viva Cristo Rey, Long Live Christ the King. You can only find letters like this in the western parts of Mexico, where the Cristero War was fought. It gives us an idea about how people in this area remember the conflict as fundamentally a religious crusade. This museum is a vital bit of history, and one that the residents of San Julián felt passionate enough to fund with a public subscription. The artifacts within were donated from people in the town, which shows how crucial it is to these rural areas to celebrate their martyred ancestors. Este museo está hecho del por los sanjulianenses para los sanjulianenses. Entonces el objetivo es que que este lugar sea una casa de resguardo de la memoria histórica, mostrar esta parte de la historia que mucho tiempo fue olvidada y que fue negada por los libros de historia de México. Y el objetivo es que no se pierda esa historia, por lo tanto el museo tiene como objetivo mostrar desde los antecedentes a nivel nacional, eh, estatal, regional y local. 
the need to relay a clear and objective vision of the war led me to what is a fascinating way of telling its story. Ballads and songs were passed down through generations. They serve as a place to store and discover history and a crucial addition to my research. El corrido no es general en toda la República Mexicana, sino de una parte de la República, ¿no? Y está muy ligado pues a las sociedades más de rancho, ¿no? El corrido jugó un papel fundamental para narrar los hechos que estaban produciéndose en ese momento, ¿no? Pues se siguen interpretando y se siguen recordando porque es algo popular, ¿no? Se escribe y se canta para la gente para narrarle los hechos que se están produciendo y que merecen la pena recordarse, ¿no? My research evolves our understanding of a time in Mexico that is vitally important to remember. Innocent lives in turmoil, stuck between two of the most influential powers at the time. Indigenous regions in the center west, especially the Tepehuano of Durango, joined the Cristero Revolt to ward off the encroachment of the Mexican state onto their ancestral lands and their everyday traditions. Here the suffering of the civil war did not really end until the 1940s. Like all civil wars, civilians were the main victims. Women played a key role as well, acting as couriers, spies, smugglers, and in traditional roles, such as cooks, cleaners, and nurses for Cristero troops. Rural civilians were reconcentrated or driven off their estates, villages, and ranches in order to create free fire zones for the federal army. Conditions facing refugees in overcrowded towns were appalling, but civilians who defied the government to return home faced reprisals from either the federal army or from the Criseros. Rural landowners were afraid of the Mexican Revolution's plans to break up the large estates and replace them with communal land holdings but their fear led many of them to support the Cristero rebels. The great agrarian reform in Mexico happened during the following years, in the 30s, mm -hmm. maybe as a consequence of the Cristiada. Mm -hmm. Maybe the government thought, if we want to control or to, to get the sympathy of the Mexican people, we have to give the land. And some peasants receive the land, but with a condition. You have to defend the government. Take the gun and be our counter guerrilla against the Cristero. So the land question was a factor in the civil war, in that dimension of civil war that was part of the tragedy. <laughs> 